Good afternoon, everyone. I would first like to thank Daddy and Mommy Pastor for allowing me to address you today, and also Mommy Babalola and all the teaching staff of Kogo Children's Church for, in <laughs> for inviting me as guest speaker to this blessed children anniversary program themed Avoid Distractions. I am very thankful to all our children teachers for the great work you are all doing in this ministry. <laughs> Teaching truly is a calling, such calling which has helped me to be the person that I am today. Amen? Amen. Before I begin, can two people tell me what you learned from watching this Nick Vajusic video, Never Give Up? When I first watched the video, right away I remembered a prayer I learned in primary school in my country, Sierra Leone, the serenity prayer, which says, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. We all see from the video that Evangelist Nick have found that serenity, peacefulness, quietness, coolness and fully accepted the way God created him with no arms or legs, something he cannot change. He can even joke about it and encourage his young audience to laugh with him, not at him. He shows how cool he is in answering the phone. He shows strength and determination when he falls and demonstrate that he is totally focused on achieving that goal of getting up. Even when he's speaking, you are not distracted by his appearance and focused on that special gift God gave him to motivate us. But his life did not start that way. I became interested to learn more about him after watching the video and found out that when he was born, his parents didn't want him. They were distracted by his appearance. His mother didn't even want to breastfeed him. You know some parents, when they give birth, they're so happy that they got their bundle of joy. But his parents were not that happy. In the hospital room, his father nearly fainted because of when he saw his son has no arms or legs. His father was a pastor and eventually they accepted, loved, and encouraged the child God had blessed them with. Even with his parents' love and acceptance, he struggled quietly with his condition. At the very young age of eight, he tried to drown himself in the bathtub, but thank God he couldn't do it when he thought of how much his parents loved him. Through prayers and reading the Bible, one chapter in particular spoke to him. John 9, 1 through 12. Read it tonight before you go to sleep. When Jesus saw a man who had been blind since birth, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. And from that moment, Evangelist Nick gave his life to Jesus Christ. Even with his disability and facing bullying, he was not distracted and increased in his teenage and young adult years. His mother knew that God had a plan and future for their special son. To encourage and keep him focused to his calling, one day she showed him a newspaper article about a man dealing with a severe disability. From that moment on, Evangelist Nick found the courage to change the things he could and at the age of 17, he started his ministry. What is your excuse? What is my excuse? The theme for the program is avoid distraction, and the anchor scripture is James 4, 7, which says, 
Therefore, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I looked up the word avoid, which means keep away from or stop yourself from doing something. I also looked up distractions, which means a thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to something else. As children of God, we we'll believe that God is the captain of our ship. If we allow him to take full control of the helm, that is the steering wheel of the ship, he, we can stop ourselves from doing something wrong and not crash into distractions. Distraction from God could be because of sin. Satan always tries his best to distract this. And when we try to avoid him and get serious about having fellowship with the Lord, he will try to distract us even more. So distraction from God is extremely dangerous. Can two people tell me some of the distraction that causes us to sin? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. I have listed the main distractions of our childhood society today. One, cell phones. Instead of concentrating on school assignments, we spend too much time on our mobile phones with cruel online postings, which can lead to cyberbullying. This harmful bullying behavior can include posting rumors, threats, sexual remarks, a victim's personal information or hate speech. Television. We spend more time watching TV than reading our Bibles or spending quality time with our family. Some of us may also watch shows that are not rated for our age groups. From such shows, we can pick up bad behavior beyond our years, thinking of boyfriend or girlfriend before our time. As Daddy Pastor always says, no boyfriend or girlfriend until our second year of college. My mother says, not until I'm 30. <laughs> I know she loves to joke with me, but seriously, depending on your career path, we may want to avoid such distractions. Three, video games. Boys spend hours on end playing a major distraction, video games. I remember there was a boy in my seventh grade class who never completed his homework and fell asleep during class. This happened because he stayed up all night playing video games instead of doing his homework. He was in the high achievers learners class, but because of this distraction, he was transferred to the lower learner's stream. He should have graduated junior high this year, but unfortunately, he's repeating eighth grade and attending summer school. Four, pornography. Ephesians 5, 3 to 4 reads, But fornication and all uncleanness or convertiousness, let it not even be named among you, as it's fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are just fitting, but rather giving of thanks. It is now easy with technology for anyone including children, to access these unacceptable and sinful acts on mobile devices. Under the supervision of my mother and to help educate me of the dangers of such things of this world, we sometimes watch detective shows that tell the story of someone who is a serial killer. Later, when they manage to track down the attacker, they come to find out that as a child, he had found pleasure in watching pornography, and in doing so, had met a child predator online, and through that evil friendship, they are abused and became, be, maybe murdered. The, trial, the child grows up to be a monster, committing crimes and spend the rest of their adult years behind bars. May it not be our portion in Jesus' name. Amen. Five, bullying. We hear in the video how evangelist Nick said he was bullied at school. 
This is a serious common problem with children. It's so common that it may not seem like a big deal. I read that it can cause lifelong emotional damage to a child. Some types of bullying are name callings, like you're too fat, you're too tall, you're too short, your skin is too dark, your nose is too flat or big, your hair is too kinky, you're too skinny, you're too ugly, etc., etc. I remember in my primary school in Sierra Leone, there was a boy in third grade, and I was in class two, who was being bullied by his classmate because he was the smallest. He was so disturbed and voiceless by the bullying that he had to repeat third grade when my class was promoted. When we all got to know him, we found out that he had some personal problems at home. We also helped him with classwork and his grades improved. A few times he was sent home because his school fees had not been paid. The owner of the school would sometimes pay his fees to avoid the embarrassing distraction. Sometimes he would come to school hungry with no breakfast. We would share a breakfast with him. Sometimes he didn't even have water and we would give him ours. Sometimes the principal would buy him food. And some of the boys in my class would put their lunch monies together and buy a large bowl of food so that they could share with their less fortunate classmate. But through it all, he will always smile and be happy as a bumblebee. My mother even has a couple of videos of him at school's birthday parties dance competition. And she would always cheer him on as he performed his famous dance moves. He loved the attention and would smile as he danced. Some days he would wait to see my mother drop a pick me up from school as she, would, as she would greet him with, good morning or good afternoon, my son. And he would reply with a toothy green ear to ear, good morning, Auntie Panda. Just that greeting will fill him up for the rest of the day. Look at your hands and study all your fingers. Are they all the same? Some are short, some are long, some are skinny, and some are fat. If you were to lose any one of them, do you think your hands will be able to function the same way? No, because God made them to work together and help each other out. This brings to mind a scripture I've heard about three times this past few weeks. In Luke 5, 17 to 26, Jesus heals a paralyzed man. The house was full. Jesus was in the house teaching and healing, and everyone wanted to see him. Some men had a friend who could not work. They believed that Jesus could heal him, so they carried him to the house on a mat. Because the house was so full, they couldn't get in. So they carried their friend up the steps to the flat roof and started tearing up the tiles. They opened a hole in the roof. Everyone in the house looked up, amazed. Then they lowered their friend into the middle of the crowd. They thought Jesus would heal their friend. Instead, Jesus said to him, your sins are forgiven. The religious leaders were very unhappy. Only God can forgive sins, they grumbled. What's easier, asked Jesus, to forgive a man's sin or make him walk? To show you that I have God's power to forgive sins, I will heal his legs. Pick up your mat and walk home, said Jesus to the man, and he did. His friends cheered and so did everyone else. Now the house was filled with praise. Now, wouldn't you want friends like those? I know I would. Six, peer pressure. Peer pressure or influence comes in many forms, and these types of peer pressure can have a huge impact on a young person's behavior. Research shows that junior high school years are the most challenging. This is when a child is making new friends and choosing an identity among those friends. I remember when I first arrived from Sierra Leone, Daddy and Mommy Pastor told me that my friends were in church, not in school. I'm 
and a couple of other parents lovingly told me the same thing. I'm glad they did. I was blessed when I started my middle school here that two well-behaved classmates were assigned to me to show me around the school, tell me the procedures, and sit with me at lunch. One of them was the assistant principal's daughter. But I really couldn't understand why we didn't have assemblies bef before we started class, as we always did in Sierra Leone. I was shocked to see students talking back to teachers, skipping class, some dressed like they were going to parties, pink, blue, or green hair, etc. I remember one day there was a girl outside our classroom being very loud. She should have been in class. The teacher went out to tell her to return to her class as she was disturbing her teaching. She followed the teacher back into the class and said words that no child should say to an adult, just plain rude. Seven, rudeness. This can come from peer pressure. Why would you, a child of God, be rude? You didn't pick it up in church, and I'm sure not at home. So it must have come from where you spend most of your time, in school. Rude refers to bad behavior or just, bad, or just plain bad manners. For example, children are taught how to say please and thank you, or they are considered rude. A rude person needs a little work. It doesn't hurt to say a simple hello or excuse me, especially to an adult. I know this doesn't work here, but I remember in Sierra Leone, the teachers would walk with a cane, <laughs> and sometimes you wouldn't even see the cane. You would just felt it at the back of your calf, and that would really hurt. That for just talking in class. How do we cure rudeness? Breaking the cycle of rudeness starts with just being nicer. We can acknowledge people and express appreciation. Don't let rude behavior worsen. Avoid rude people. Think about how your behavior will make people think about you. Apologize if you do find yourself being rude. Believe in politeness and always smile. A, house chores. I smile mockingly on this topic when I think of how easy we have it here in America with the washing machine and dryer, dishwasher, vacuum cleaners, Swiffer mops, robot vacuums, or take out the garbage, etc. I say God bless America and the Western world. <laughs> Yet we still complain or just plain lazy when we are asked to just load the machine and or turn on the switch, walk to the garbage can, put food on the table, clear the table. Put your phones in the, put your clothes in the machine, etc. Okay, let me take you to Sierra Leone again. And more than likely, the story is in the same in most third world countries. In these countries, children get up in the middle of dawn to fetch water, to do their chores, bend down and sweep, crop towels, fetch water light a fire to boil water or cook, iron their uniforms and those of younger siblings, etc. Some even have to take their mother or auntie's things to sell to the marketplace before they run to school. After school, instead of doing homework, they're outside selling. Be honest. So do you think you have it, it, it hard? Be honest. Don't be distracted from your chores. Mommies and daddies, their parents, with all due respect, please, we need your attention as children. We need your help and encouragement because you are the best friend we have. We need you to give us quality time. Working hard is good, but giving all your time to work so that you can give us all the latest gadgets could be an error because because some parents end up most times lo losing track of their children, whereby the children are easily distracted and end up in things like 
drugs, and immorality. May it not be our portion in Jesus' name. Some parents tend to compete with other people, knowingly or unknowingly, giving all the valuables and forgetting the values. Valuables soon lose the value, while values are long life. My mother learned many lifelong lessons from her parents, my grandparents. That's what makes her the strong single parent that she is today. I always listen intently as she tells me of her school day's experience. At age eight, my mother was sent to boarding school in England. In the second year of boarding school, my grandfather, who had worked tirelessly from the country he loved, Sierra Leone, was arrested, together with all members of his political party and charged with treason, meaning betrayal. Long story short, my grandfather was a political prisoner for seven years. Him and his colleagues slept on the bar concrete floors of the gallows, where other members of the party were executed. There are so much more I could say, so in summary, because of my time, children, we should all know that after God, no one loves us more than our parents. When we turn out good, we are not only good for ourselves, but for our family and society. Likewise, when we are not good, we are not only a distraction to ourselves, but we cause pain for our parents and our community. We must obey our parents. It is a commandment with a promise. When a child avoids distraction and comes out well, it is an indication that the future will be, a, will be good. Can everyone please rise? Can you please repeat after me? Say, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can. And wisdom to know the difference. Thank you all. God bless you.